I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Alex Byrne. He is a professor of philosophy at MIT and author of Trouble with Gender, which we're going to be talking about today. Alex, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Adam, thanks very much for having me on. What is the trouble with gender, Alex? <laughs> well, there are all sorts of trouble, uh, troubles with gender. Of course, the, the title is... Um, a play on Judith Butler's very famous uh, 1990 book, uh, Gender Trouble. It's also actually um, a play on a 1960s science fiction novel called Trouble with Lichen by the, the British author John Wyndham. And I think the epigraph to the book is a quote, or the epigraph to the introduction is actually a, a quote from that uh, from that novel where the protagonist says something like, well, um, uh, the proponents of, of women's liberation made a great mistake. The, the, the enemies of women are not men. After all, they are women. And of course, that's all very tongue in cheek on on my part, but it 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 was supposed to um, uh, reflect the fact that the various cancellations that are, have occurred in my own discipline of philosophy over the subject of sex and gender have been to a large extent actually driven by women themselves, moreover, feminist philosophers, uh, philosophers typically. Uh, women working in a branch of philosophy called, called feminist philosophy. And this has been noted a number of times. I'm certainly not the only one to have, to have pointed this out. So there's a lot of, um, if you like, uh, female on female conflict, which is driving some of these cancellations and, and no platformings that we see in this, in this area. It was really interesting to read about the history of this gender philosophy movement, not only the recent cancel culture stuff, but going back, as you mentioned, to feminist philosophers who you would think would be the last people to open the door to saying men can be women. Yes, yes, that's right. And um, uh, back in the day, um, you know, of course, fa intellectual fashions change. Back in the day, it's very easy to find uh, feminist philosophers saying in no uncertain terms that if you like men, men can't be women or that transgender women um, uh, are not in, in fact, in fact, women. Um, I mean, feminist icons like the uh, Australian writer Jermaine Greer uh, are just one example. Greer herself was the subject of a number of cancellations over her views on this on this issue but yes the um the sort of um uh fashionable fashionable opinions more or less turned on a dime in a relatively short space of time and now within the the mainstream of uh of feminist philosophy um you either have to endorse uh, the the slogan that that trans women are women, or else if you don't strictly speaking endorse it, then you have to do some backpedaling and qualifications and explain exactly um, why it's not precisely correct, even though um, uh, the fact that it isn't correct is is a sort of huge cosmic injustice. You can't just come out flatly and say um, uh, all women are female, transgender women are male, therefore transgender women are not are not women. You only find this kind of plain speaking among the the exiled so-called gender critical crowd of of philosophers, which includes the British philosopher Kathleen Stark, who was hounded out of her job at Sussex University after about three years of sustained harassment. And the 
University of Melbourne philosopher Holly Lawford Smith, who's fortunately still still going, still has an academic job. It sounds like most of this traces back to this idea of language and how you're defining gender specifically. So most of us use sex and gender interchangeably. And you outline that there's historical reason for that. And that's pretty much the case across every language, but at least within academia and maybe spread into popular culture over the last few years, there's this insistence that they're separate and that gender refers to only the social category of things that are gendered and sex refers to the exclusively biological as if they're separable. Yes, that's right. I mean, this, this takes us back to your, your very first question. Um, chapter two, I think, uh, is called gender in quotes trouble. Um, and here the idea that is not so much that gender itself, whatever that may, may be is troublesome, but, uh, the word gender is something that should be, um, treated with great, uh, with, with great caution. The problem with the word gender is, as you said, in, um, in many usages, it's just a synonym for sex, as in male and female. And having that sense, or having a word with, uh, with that sense, which isn't the word sex, is um, very useful because the word sex itself is ambiguous, of course, between male and female on the one hand and having intercourse on the other. Um, and now, uh, uh, it's never, never used to be the case, but now it's impossible to avoid the topic of sex in the, se in, in the sense of, uh, of sexual, uh, sexual intercourse. So it's very useful to have another word uh, to refer to the two great reproductive classes, male and female, and gender does that job very nicely. Okay, so there's so there's huge pressure, if you like, uh, to make the word gender mean sex, as in male and female. It has utility. That sense of the word gender is not going away. Um, so. Um, so the best thing from general communicative purposes would be if we just stuck with that sense of the word gender and didn't use the word gender to mean anything else, because confusion is just bound to ensue if you start using the word gender to mean something else, given that the sex sense of gender is just not going away. Unfortunately, Theorists have insisted on using the word gender to mean a wide variety of other things. For instance, they use it to mean gender identity. They use it to mean masculinity and femininity. They use it to mean gender roles or sex roles, uh, sex typed social roles, in other words. Um, and in the hands of Feminist philosophers, they have used it to mean the categories, um, categories like woman and man. All of this um, does not help understanding or communication in the slightest. And so I think we should, uh, in, the, in the interests of um, pushing the discussion on, we should never use gender to mean anything other than, than sex. I hear this doesn't mean that social categories like gender identity or gender role or stereotypes don't exist, but just that you can't shorthand it to a single word gender because then there's confusion between translate. Yes, yes that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And um, it, it also often happens, the, the, this is not the case in, in analytic philosophy, because analytic philosophers uh, try as hard as they can to be clear, but it often happens in gender studies, and the work of Judith Butler is a prime example, uh, that it's very unclear what the word gender is, is supposed to mean. It's, it's pretty clear that it's not supposed to mean sex, but what, what, it, what it actually does mean is, uh, is 
is quite obscure. I mean, you know, you can read Judith Butler's Gender Trouble and ask yourself, okay, what does the word gender mean in, 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 in this book? And the answer seems to be that, well, on different pages, it means different things. You just have to have a, a, a guess from the context as to what she had in mind. The, the reading that you quote from her, it's very, very complicated, needlessly so. It's kind of interesting to read. And then there's all these excerpts that you can draw, like from Bovar's, uh The Second Sex, this idea that a one, one is not a woman, no one is not born a woman, but becomes yeah. a woman. And that seems to be misinterpreted as it's only a social construct as opposed to something like females are socialized in stereotypically feminine ways. They don't have to be. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Um, so, so Butler was one was one I think of the 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 first people, at least fairly early on in her her, her career, maybe in the in the nineteen eighties. She interpreted Simone de Beauvoir's famous remark. Sorry, Simone de Beauvoir was a French philosopher, the uh, the partner of Jean Paul Sartre, and uh, her most famous book is called The Second Sex, published in 1949. She, she did not um, use the word or the French equivalent of, of gender in that book, but uh, often the, the so-called sex-gender distinction, the distinction between sex on the one hand and something that we'll label gender on the other, is, is often read back into that book. But anyway, uh, the most famous line from The Second Sex is, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. And uh, Butler interpreted that uh, to mean something like, uh, one is not born, but rather becomes an actress. In the sense that if you take, uh, if you take an actress, Take say Margot Robbie from oh this is a, a good uh, an appropriate example of that. So you take Mar Margot Robbie who starred in the movie Barbie. Um, when she was born, she was not fated by biology to grow up to be an actress. Right, that was like a that was a career choice. If she'd grown up in some other society or made different career choices or whatever, then she wouldn't have been an actress. So it was by no means uh, a biological inevitability that she would end up as an actress. So in that sense, um, uh, one is not born, but rather becomes an actress. And Butler gave exactly the same interpretation to one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. That is, it's not so much that a, a woman is like exactly like an occupation, but it, it's strongly analogous to uh, to one. You have to grow up in a particular society, um, uh, be regarded in a certain way, in a certain way, in order to be uh, in order to be a woman. Um, so, from that, you get the idea that the category woman is a a social category, like the category actress, or like the category police officer or like the category surgeon or like the category podcaster. Um, being a podcaster is obviously not um, a purely biological matter. You're only a podcaster because you're embedded in a certain society with uh, a certain kind of technology and a certain kind of um, uh, mass media and so on and so forth. Uh, if you grew up on a desert island with no uh, with no technology, no means of communicating with the outside world, there's no way you could be a podcaster. You'd be a vertebrate and a mammal and a primate, um, mm -hmm. and you know uh, maybe you'd have a beard. You certainly could have a beard if you wanted to on a uh, on a desert island. You don't need a society to have a beard, but you do need a society to be a uh, a podcaster. And then similarly, you need a society in order to be an actress. If you grew up on a, uh, if Margot Robbie had grown up from birth on a, on a desert island, she wouldn't have ended up as an actress. And then similarly, 
uh, going back to, to woman, if Margot on, on the butler view, if Margot had grown up on a desert island, um, not embedded in any kind of society at all, she wouldn't in fact have grown up to be a woman because being a woman is to occupy some kind of social position in some kind of complicated, complicated, uh, society. And as you were, as you were saying, I, I think, I mean, in a way, it doesn't matter what Beauvoir herself thought. These questions are generally pretty uninteresting. All that matters is whether she had any good arguments for it. But I, for what it's worth, I think that uh, this is clearly not Beauvoir's view. Beauvoir did not have this, um, this social view of what it is to be a woman. Instead, she basically thought that, as I, as I think, not entirely originally, that to be a woman is just to be an adult female of our species. That's all that's required to be a woman. So if Margot Robbie, say, uh, grows up on a, uh, a desert island, um, not embedded in any human society of, of any kind, uh, that won't prevent her from growing up to be a woman. Um, so I don't think that was Beauvoir's view. More importantly, there's absolutely nothing in the second sex, uh, that, um, provides a good argument for the view that Butler attributes to Beauvoir, that to be a woman is to occupy some kind of social position. Again, it all depends on how you're defining these words. So if woman is adult human female, then you're not born a woman, but it's inevitable that you become one if you're female. The only right. thing that's missing is age, the adult portion. But then if you define woman in some more abstract way, as in stereotypically feminine adult, then it's certainly not inevitable and it's socially contingent. And it's using the same word to make different arguments yes, when people yes, are interpreting right. it differently. Well, I should make two, two points about that. Yeah. So first of all, um, given that Beauvoir's view was not that Margot Robbie on, alone on a desert island uh, would not grow up to be a woman, what was her view? What was the point of saying one is uh, not born but rather becomes a woman? And as you, in effect, said, her view, I think, was that um, one is not born but rather becomes, because of socialization, a stereotypically feminine woman. Uh, so she anticipated uh, what was a, a standard view among the second wave feminists of the late 60s and 70s, namely that um, to a very large extent, males and females are gender blank slates. So if you look at stereotypically female behavior in, in humans, that's due to socialization with almost no component being due to innate biology. Um, and we, we make the mistake, according to this view of thinking that um, stereotypical differences between uh, males and females are somehow inevitable because of innate biology, whereas really they're just due to contingent uh, social and, and cultural influences. Um, sorry, so, yeah, so that was the first point. Um, what, is, uh, what is Beauvoir's view? And then the other point is uh, just about words. So Maybe you weren't, maybe you weren't suggesting this, but sometimes people say, oh, this is just a matter of semantics. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of, you know, how, how, how to define words or how to use words and we can define them however we like or use them however we like. So there's no real answer to the question, what is a woman? Uh, it all depends. How, how you choose to define it. If you choose to define it one way, then women are so-and-so. 
And if you choose to define it some other way, the women are such and such. Um, so the question, what is a woman, is some, uh, some uninteresting semantic question. It's not really a question about the independently existing non non-linguistic world. Now, I, th I think that's a, uh, that's a big mistake. Um, it just takes some other, some other question that has nothing to do with sex and gender, like what is gold, let's say. So we have some samples of gold lying around or some samples of a yellow metal. We call this gold and we wonder what it is. Is there something, something more we can say about this? about this substance. I mean, it appears to be a metal, let's say. Is it really a metal? Um, is it an element or is it a compound? If it is an element, what, it, what is its atomic number? And the answer to the last two questions are, well, no, the answer to the three questions are, A, it's a, a metal, B, it's an element, and C, it's an element with atomic number 79. Now, these are not um, uh, questions about how how to define the word how to define the word gold. In other words, you can't say, "Oh well, yeah, that's just your view because you choose to define the word gold in this way. I, Adam, choose to define the word gold in in some other way. So there's no like language independent answer to the question. What is gold? If you think that gold is a uh, is a compound, or that it has atomic number sixteen, or that it isn't a metal, you're just wrong. I'm the one who's right. So uh, there's no reason why the question "What is a woman?" should be taken um, to be dissimilar to the question "What is gold?" In that respect, the question "What is gold?" has some perfectly objective non non linguistic answers that don't have have anything to do with the English language. Um, you can ask the very same question in French or Swahili or Polish, and similarly with the question "What is a woman?" There's some sort of meta absurdity here that philosophy falls victim to a lot, where we can seriously debate this precise definitions of things to something that seems so obvious doesn't even have to be a question like, what is a woman? As you know, there's a documentary by the same name that's kind of just pointing out the absurdity where everyday people will clearly point to who are women and then serious biologists and philosophers of gender kind of struggle to answer at the very least will give really long, complicated answers in a way that's it's just an intuitive category for most people. And philosophers can do this for really anything. Like, what is a chair? I know it when I see it, but try and come up with a precise definition, and it's very, very hard. Yeah, right. That's an excellent question. That, that excellent point. Let me make two remarks about that. So, uh, so first, of course, sometimes the experts are right, and the ordinary and the ordinary person is is wrong. About you know about all kinds of phenomena. I mean, maybe the ordinary, maybe many many ordinary people uh, think that um, the the Earth is only thousands of years old, or something like that. In which case, uh, experts in geology can uh, can correct their mistakes. Um, maybe. Uh, uh, Maybe ordinary people think that, um, to, to bring, to use an example that's sort of closer to the present discussion, maybe ordinary people think that to be male is to have XY chromosomes, or to be male is to have a penis or something, and to be female is to have XX chromosomes and or to have a, a vagina. Okay, if that's what you think, then you're wrong, and biologists can correct you on that. So, um, so there are plenty of examples where you know the experts are right and the ordinary and the ordinary person is, is wrong. So it could it could be that the ordinary person is is confused on the question of what a woman is, um, and the experts are are right. 
Um, so just pointing out that um, the expert disagree with the ordinary person is not necessarily to say that the the, 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 the experts are wrong. There are many such cases where the experts are the ones who are correct. And then on the other, the, the other issue I wanted to raise was um, the question of, of definition. So I, I remember from uh, Matt Walsh's film, What is a Woman, which you just mentioned, uh, which I think was 20, did, did that come out in 2022? Maybe twenty twenty two. last but, few years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in that in that documentary, Walsh uh, says something like, "Well, you know, in order for a word to be meaningful, you have to be able to uh, you have to be able to define it." And his whole the whole joke of the documentary is that these experts, when asked what is a woman, are unable to answer the question. Actually, lots of ordinary people, when asked what is a woman, are also unable to to answer the question. Um, although Matt Walsh's wife at the end of the film does give what I think is the correct definition, namely an adult human female. Um, but if you think about that for a moment, it's clearly wrong that every word has to have a definition because you just end up on this infinite regress. If you define word A in terms of words B and C, then you can always ask, well, okay, well, what's the definition of words B and C? And then maybe you define the word B in terms of words D and E, in which case you can ask for the definition of words D and E, and eventually you're going to come around in, in a circle, or else you're going to end at words that have no definition whatsoever. And in fact, it's been widely known or widely accepted in, in philosophy for many years, that most words do not have definitions in the sense that you can state necessary and sufficient conditions for the word to apply using, using other words. I mean, there are exceptions. Um, and the great irony is that woman seems to be one of those exceptions. So there's, a, so there's a class of words that, that seem to be exceptions, and those are words for female and male, certain words for female and male animals, like doe or, uh, or sow or peacock versus, versus peahen or ewe, E-W-E. A ewe is an adult female sheep. And that is not some rough and that doesn't seem to be some rough and ready definition like the kind of definition of the word chair that you find in a dictionary namely something you know a seat with a back and four legs for one person or something like that uh that's certainly rough and ready because there are um there are many chairs that you know don't have four legs uh that that don't have a back and so on so that's not um, a perfectly precise definition, but definitions for words like you, adult female sheep, do seem to be perfectly precise. I mean, what's a counterexample? A counterexample would be a, a you that isn't an adult female sheep or an adult female sheep that isn't a you and just don't seem, there don't seem to be any. So the irony is that on the, on the one hand, you wouldn't really expect just a priori a word, um, a word to have a precise definition. Uh, so if you just stumbled across the word woman, absent any other information, you wouldn't expect that to have a precise definition. But in fact, it turns out that woman does belong to that small class of words for which there are precise definitions. So even the precise definition, so say adult, human, female, yeah. for woman, every single one of those pieces, if you're really postmodern about it, you can disentangle. And so like, what is adult? Well, you, one way to easily define it could be something like you become an adult when you're 18 years of age. But that's also sort of an arbitrary definition that's contingent on, well, how you defined it, because like one day prior, are you fundamentally different? You could say 
you're an adult at 17 years, 364 days of age. You can really define it any which way. So it comes back to this idea of how are you defining things? That's not helpful. I'm not trying to seriously push that argument. But what do you, what do, you do in the face of that, where even the most precise definition, someone can say, actually, it's not precise because it depends on how you precisely defined okay, the sub piece. Yes. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So with respect to adult, it's true that there is the social sense or reading of adult, according to which you're an adult, just in case you've attained the age of majority, you're now allowed to do certain things. You have certain privileges that you weren't, uh, uh, that you didn't have before. Um, that does not seem to be the appropriate understanding of adult in, uh, um, the slogan, a woman is an adult, an adult human female. If it were, then that would make being a woman, a partly social matter. Um, it would also make being a, a, a woman a matter of the particular laws of your area. I mean, you know, uh, in, in, in America, laws about the age of majority vary uh, by state, and they certainly vary by country. So on this view, whether whether you're a woman or not depends on, on where you live, which doesn't really seem to be the right result. A much more plausible interpretation of adult is the sense of adult um, you find in the account of a you as an adult female she. Here it means, roughly speaking, um, adult as in having uh, attained sexual maturity, more or less. Uh, Okay, so that's the so that's the relevant sense of adult. And then you pointed out that the word adult is vague. It has borderline cases. So if you take a um, 15 year old or a 16 year old, um, it might be unclear whether this person is an adult and also unclear whether this person is not an adult. So the word adult is, in that sense, vague. And then once you understand what it is for a word to be vague, you see that almost every word is vague. So this mm -hmm. goes back to the, the ancient paradox of the heap. The word heap is vague. A um, hundred, hundred grains piled together make a heap. Um, two grains don't make a heap. Now, if we remove one grain from the 100 grain heap, um, okay, we have 99 grains. That still makes a heap. 98, still a heap. And eventually we're going to get to a point where it's not clear whether we have a heap or whether we have a non-heap. Um, similarly, with, with, with color words, if you imagine a part of the spectrum from red on the right to yellow on the left, um, and you... Uh, move from a patch on the spectrum that's clearly red all the way to the all the way to the left. At some point, you're going to uh, light upon a color that is neither clearly neither clearly red nor nor clearly nor clearly yellow nor nor clearly orange. Stick stick orange in there between between red and red and yellow. So all sorts of words are vague. Does this mean that there can't be precise definitions? Well, no, because what, what, what's crucial is that the, the vagueness of the word that you're defining has to match the vagueness of the words you're using to define it. So just take the case of the case of a woman, and let's suppose that a 16-year-old girl is not clearly an adult and not clearly not an adult. Uh, this will only be a problem for the definition of woman as an adult human female if this, this person is clearly a woman or clearly not a woman. If the person is neither clearly a woman nor clearly not a woman, then no problem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's in a sense, it's only nominally about gender. It seems like this is all tied to much deeper philosophical problems in language and in perception. And I know you have expertise in philosophy of mind and perception as well. Another example I was thinking about is 
your book, Trouble with Gender, we can look at this and see the cover and see that it's a book. You can also look at it from the side and the cover is blue. The side is thin and white. And just the raw perceptual information we're getting there is completely different. So there's nothing just from that raw sensory input that's telling us it's the same thing. Because you could have one weird definition where, you know, something is a book only if it looks front facing and from the side, it's no longer a book, but we have object permanence, you know, as you rotate it, it's like, yeah. the, it's, it's the same thing. And that's as far as I was able to develop the idea, but there's some thought of whatever fuzzy borders we have when like we recognize that the same object is the same thing when viewed from a variety of perspectives. It seems like it applies to all categories. Like you're still you, oh, yes, even as you right. age, even if you get a haircut, no, right. all of these superficial things. That's right. That's right. Although, of course, there is... Um, um, there is a point to be made about, uh, about, about women and girls and men and boys in, in, this, in this regard, namely that... Uh, whether you're a woman or not depends on what what stage of life you're at. Mm -hmm. So um, you were always Adam from the day you were from from the day you were born, or you were always human from the day you were born. You're always male from the day you were born, but you certainly didn't start off a man. Uh, you only you started off life as a boy, and you only uh, you only later. Uh, became a man and so in that respect being being a man is a bit like um like being a student it's something that someone is for a for a stage of their life uh not uh not necessarily for all of it mm -hmm. and it has fuzzy borders again i mean it's for students yeah that's it's right clear. But, it's but like... again the important the important point to make there is that is that everything in that sense has 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 fuzzy yeah. borders? It's it's something like an argument from absurdity because I'm not trying to say this has fuzzy borders, therefore it's invalid definition. It's more like realizing that any definition you can come up with about anything seems to have fuzzy borders. Even gold, like the the number of atoms in an element, defining that element, you can still have variants of it in terms of. Do they have the same number of neutrons or not? And if you want yeah. to get more precise, you can define those as separate things. And if you want to be less precise, or you can just group them as, as the same category, like what really matters is the number of protons, not the number of neutrons. So you can have a whole bunch of nested definitions, and some are obvious. And we seem to naturally have a way of just skipping over all that complexity and like i'm able to recognize that an object is the same thing even if you rotate it i'm able to recognize that someone is the same person even as they age and even as we use different language for are you a boy are you a man that's right that's right um Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I kind of lost 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 my train of thought. I was going to say something about what you about what you just said, but uh, well, I could say the same uh, thing uh, for the human piece of defining man or woman. Sure, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's another weird one because obviously we know that we are human and we can sort of define it, but in terms of a precise definition that would say apply to us, but not to Neanderthals. Neanderthals had most characteristics that we have. They could even mate with us. So again, it's a weird example of fuzzy borders, and I don't want to push on that any further. No, that's right. Sorry, I just sorry, remember what I what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. The example of Neanderthals is also is also a good one. I mean, here you might think uh, this is actually a counterexample to the cl the claim that to be a woman is to be an adult human female. If you take Neanderthals to be a different species, you can you can certainly find I found myself examples of uh, people talking about uh, men and women Neanderthals. So if uh, you can have a, just a straightforward woman Neanderthal, 
then that is a counter. That person would be a counterexample to the view that to be a woman, you have to be an adult, an adult human female. And so you have to be a uh, human. But the main, sorry, the main point I wanted to make was, um, in a way, we don't have to get hung up over these issues because it's enough to say, it's, it's certainly enough uh, to dispute orthodoxy in feminist philosophy and gender studies that the definition of woman as an adult human female is uh, right to a very close approximation. Whatever mm -hmm. problems it has, um, it's not because to be a woman is to occupy some kind of social position or to have a certain kind of psychology or to look or behave in a certain way. These are all ideas floating around in philosophy and, and gender studies. Um, it's more, so, so in that respect, it's like saying, look, the definition of gold as the element with atomic number 79. Maybe that's not exactly right for the, uh, for the reason that you were, you, you were giving, but it's kind of close enough. It's not that we need to add some social element into the definition of gold. For example, gold is that element which is highly valued in human societies or something like that. No, no, that's not part of what it is to be gold. That's just a mm -hmm. contingent accidental feature of, uh, of gold. Alex, you alluded earlier to the precise biological definition of sex and that most people get it wrong. So most people might refer to genitalia or to chromosomes and biologists don't define sex that way. And you give some examples either of other species or of intersex conditions where you can still be male or female by virtue of what type of gametes you produce, sperm or eggs. And that could, in some cases, some rare cases, be independent of chromosome or of genitalia. But then there's also this sort of counterfactual idea of even though young children aren't yet producing sperm or eggs, they're still considered male or female because they could. And even though some people are infertile, they're still considered male or female because they would. But then if you allow for that sort of, well, it's not about what gametes they're actively producing. It's more like what they would in ideal circumstances. Couldn't you also apply that to Difference, different gender identities where it's something like, well, someone in one condition is producing eggs, but if they get their ovaries removed, they no longer are. And maybe if there were some way that you could insert artificial testes that were producing something like, t something like sperm, then that would move them into the biological category. So does that make sense? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, right. So a couple of things about, about ma male and female, first of all. So, um, so philosophers, uh, 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 at least philosophers who work on, on sex and gender, have had this sort of terrible habit of thinking of being female or being male as having this um, cluster of features, primary, secondary, sex characteristics, um, maybe other uh, features um, like um, having, chromoso uh, having a certain chromosomal complement or having certain hormone levels. And I think the the reason why they made this mistake is partly because the the focus has been exclusively on humans, and they've somehow temporarily forgotten that we're just one variety of sexed animal. And indeed, it's not just animals that are sexed; plants are also uh, are also sexed. So once you realise that 
um, you know, you, Adam, are just as male as a male cannabis plant, it's clear that to be male is not a matter of having certain hormone levels or having certain chromosomes or having a, uh, a penis or a deep voice or whatever, but something much more abstract. And as, uh, as you, as you in effect said, uh, the, the biologists say something like, okay, to be male is to, uh, produce small gametes, sex cells, sperm, and to be female is to produce large gametes, sex cells, uh, eggs. And that works for the male cannabis plant, just as it work, works for you. So in that sense, being male is really a, a very abstract, high-level feature of, uh, of organisms. Chromosomes are just one of the many mechanisms by which organisms become male or female in the first place. It's just the mammalian sex determination system, yeah, the XX, XY system. It's just the mammalian sex determination system. Other animals have different um, chromosomal roots to the same outcome, and yet other animals don't use chromosomes at all as a way of uh, determining what sex the organism is. I mean, for instance, famously, alligators have a temperature-dependent de uh, sex determination system. Depending on the temperature at which the eggs hatch, uh, that's going mm -hmm. to affect whether uh, the baby alligator is, is male or female. Okay, so then um, you, were, you were making a, a, a point that this slogan to be male is to produce small gametes and to be female is to produce large gametes. That can't quite be right because males might not produce large gametes, sorry, small gametes for all sorts of reasons. Um, one just might be uh, developmental. Mm -hmm. uh, male babies don't produce, um, don't produce small gametes, not yet. Um, but they're male nonetheless. They're just as male as adults like you and me, or just as male as the as the male cannabis plant. And of course, females after uh, uh, human females after they go through menopause don't produce large ga gametes anymore. They're still female. So, uh, what's the best way of sort of faithful to the biologist's usage of fixing this problem? Well, here's, here's, here's one proposal, which is, I, I think, close enough. It's not, it's not perfectly correct. And uh, this is the idea that to be male is either to be on the developmental pathway that results in the production of uh, large gametes, sorry, of small gametes, or else um, it's to be... Um, uh, on the on the off ramp, if you like, of, of of that of that developmental pathway. So you can think of uh, postmenopausal females as um, gracefully sliding down the off ramp of the developmental pathway that results in the production of large gametes. So that, at any rate, is a much closer approximation to. Um, to what the biologists have in mind uh, than the crude slogan to be male is to produce small gametes and to be female is to produce large ones. But then you were raising some other much more interesting, kind sort of philosophically more interesting issue about, uh, well, um, what about wild counterfactual situations in which, you know, my testes are removed and ovaries are, uh, are implanted. You know, that I, I have the potential, let's say, let's pretend I have the potential in that sense to produce, uh, to produce large gametes. So doesn't that mean that I'm, that I'm female as well as male? Yeah. And, and if, if the definition depends on the gametes, one is 
either currently producing or has just ever been on the life track to produce, yeah. then it seems like, at least in that counterfactual, you could change your sex. And what I and maybe most people have as sort of an implicit definition, it's more like a prototype theory where you have a bunch of different features that are associated with sex and maybe none of them are necessary, but enough of them are sufficient. And you talk about several rare intersex disorders in your book. And the one that stands out to me most is complete androgen insensitivity. So here you have a genetic male whose body is producing testosterone, but because of androgen insensitivity, the testosterone has nothing to bind to and it's functionally inert. But males have low levels of estrogen and progesterone that are enough to initiate female genital development prenatally. So a genetic male with, with complete androgen insensitivity won't just not develop a penis, but will develop a normal, healthy looking vagina. And not only that, they are not destined to live their lives as prepubescent girls. The low levels of estrogen and progesterone that we have are even enough to develop breasts and other secondary sex characteristics. So they essentially live their lives as infertile women. And you pointed out, okay, they might be, they might live their lives and identify as women, but in this very technical sense, based on gametes, they're still male. And I thought, okay, again, if we define it specifically on potential to produce sperm and being on this developmental track, even if it went wrong, then in that very precise way, they're male. But in every single other way, we'd think about them including look at it, looking at them and their genitals and their gender role and behavior and felt identity and sexual attraction, basically every other piece that you can think of, aside from chromosome and gametes, they fit the bill for female. And there's this thought of, if no one else could tell, including themselves, why isn't that a sufficient definition? Excellent. Yes, of course, that... Uh, uh, CAIS is perhaps the, the most spectacular intersex condition. It's, it's extremely rare. It, it does bring out um, an important point, which is that it's one thing to say that someone is male or female, or that someone is a, a man or a woman, but it's quite another matter to say that they should be treated in a certain way. So it might be that um, for the most part, females are treated in um, uh, in a certain way and males are treated in 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 some other way. Okay, let's make it let's make it sport. Let's say. So we have um, women's sports and uh, and men's sports. Men are supposed to uh, play in the men's league, and women are supposed to play in uh, in the women's league. Well, let's, make, let's let's just make it males and females. Sorry, males are supposed to play on the males' league. Women, um, females are supposed to play on the the female league. Okay, now this is not obviously an intersex condition. I'm just making some 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 general point uh, suggested by the CAIS example. So now let's take a, a trans man, that is a natal female who has medically transitioned with the help of, of, of uh, testosterone. So the trans man, say, has male pattern baldness and, uh, uh, and the beard, and to the external observer, um, looks exactly like a man, maybe a somewhat short man, maybe a man with a somewhat high-pitched voice. Uh, but a man, nonetheless. Uh, okay, so let's further suppose that if you're a natal female, which seems reasonable, if you're a natal female and you take testosterone, it's actually not going to change your sex. It just changes some of your secondary sex characteristics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have this male-looking female who further um, identifies in some sense as a as a male, thinks of himself as a as a man. Um, okay. 
That does not mean that we can't let this female play on the on the male team. Okay, by hypothesis, this person is female. Does this mean that we can't that we have to treat the person as a female? Does it mean that um, we have to bar this person from taking part? in the male-only sporting events? Well, no, not at all. I think any reasonable person would think, sure, I mean, what is the harm letting this person, you know, be like very insulting and um, demeaning to insist that the person play on the female team and the, the other females wouldn't like it anyway. Let the person play on the male team. It's not as if this person has a particular athletic advantage. So that's just some illustration of how the question, who's a female and who's a male, uh, comes apart from the question, who should be treated as a male and who should be treated as, uh, as a female? Okay, so, do, so to go back to complete androgen in, insensitivity syndrome, um, whether or not these individuals are male, there is absolutely no question that they should be treated as female in every conceivable social circumstance. Uh, so let's get that out of the way, uh, out of the way, first of all. Um, okay, but then you were, I think, you were wanting to go further and say that these people are in fact female, or um, maybe, they're, maybe they're male in some very, very narrow technical sense of, of, of male, but in some other sense, they aren't male. I think so, and I'll expand on the reasoning yeah. behind that. So later, when you talk about gender identity, you point out that it kind of sounds essentialist, as in there's just this intrinsic feeling and one can know what your gender is and you don't really have to prove it or have any definitions. It just is. And it's this innate essentialist category. Now, this definition of, let's say, a complete androgen insensitivity person who is female in basically every single respect, except for the fact that because of the, the way that they were born and because in, even though they're not actively produce, producing sperm, they have a Y chromosome and they've, they could have if they didn't have the androgen insensitivity disorder. It almost starts to sound essentialist to me in that you're saying, this is someone who should be treated as female and thinks they're female and is recognized as female in literally every respect except for the essentialist fact that they're not. Yeah, I, it's true that it, um, essentialism is, uh, is a dirty word or it's a, a dirty word in, in, in feminist philosophy. I guess I am an essentialist mm -hmm. um, in certain respects. I don't think there's anything wrong with essentialism. Um, Take take another example. Um, uh, you can breed. Of course, there are a whole variety of, of of dog breeds. You can breed them to almost any shape and size. Um, and maybe this is slightly science fictional, but imagine you could breed a dog so it looked exactly like a cat. It looked and behaved like a cat. And you can certainly go, I mean, in, uh, as things actually stand, I'm sure you could go some way to producing a breed of dog that looked pretty much like a cat. But imagine, you know, you mm -hmm. could go, as it were, all the way. So now the ordinary person just wouldn't be able to tell whether this was, um, whether this was a dog. Sorry, wouldn't be able to tell that this was a dog. Um, you know, it purrs like a cat, it walks like a cat, it has a cat's tail, it has... Uh, a cat's whiskers and and so on, but you know it's a dog. It can it can breed with other dogs. It can't breed with uh, with with cats. Um, you know, if we dissected it, let's say we would see clear signs that it was the the species Canis familiaris rather than a cat. Um, okay, now. For all, I, I, I love cats. I'm not really a dog person myself. Um, if I want a cat, would this um, cat-like dog be an adequate substitute? Yeah, sure. Why not? What the hell? 
for all practical purposes, it is, it is, it is a cat. Um, it would bring me just as much pleasure uh, as a real cat would. Um, I wouldn't take this dog, this, this cat-like dog, out to the dog park. Um, if someone said, oh, um, I really don't like dogs, uh, you know, she, this person is coming around for dinner or something, I really don't like dogs, can I just make sure that you don't have a dog? I, I, I wouldn't say, well, actually, I do have a dog. I'd say, mm -hmm. uh, I, have a, I have a cat. Uh, knowing that um, it really doesn't matter from this person's point of view that this cat-like dog really is a dog and, and, not a, uh, and not a cat. Still, I do not have a cat. I just have a dog. There's no, there's no sense of the word cat on which I have a cat. I still have a dog. It's just a dog that looks remarkably like a cat. And should be treated as a cat in all in in almost all circumstances, except perhaps when I when I take it to the vet. Or we also talked about language being really a matter of consensus. It, in some sense, it's kind of circular. So if people define things in a way that, in all practical respects, it's a cat, why don't we just say, okay, it is a cat, except for a very precise definition of speciation, where we can call it a dog, and maybe biologists will want to do that, but. To any human who cares, this is now a cat. Well, I think maybe you disagree with this point, but I think um, if you if you breed, look, it, let me put it another way. So there's that saying: um, if it looks like a, a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, then it is a duck. Um, I'm not quite sure what the point of that saying is. But surely everyone recognizes that, okay, literally speaking, um, uh, this, this is not correct. You really could have something that looked like a duck and walked like a duck and quacked like a duck, which was not, in fact, a duck. Um, you know, just as you can have in the, in the wild, um, like, um, I don't know, a butterfly that looks exactly like a leaf. Mm -hmm. Maybe it behaves like a leaf and that it just lies still and allows itself to be blown by the wind or something. That doesn't make it a leaf. So, um, by the same token, if we breed our dog to look exact, look and behave exactly like a cat, it's still not a cat. Like, we're functionally equivalent to a cat, or it's just as good as a cat for many what years. I what I was a Many bit confused practical by. circumstances, but it's literally not a cat. I think that in our philosophy of mind and gender and the way we're trying to define these things, you and I agree more than disagree. But then I still came thinking, okay, if we're right, then what happens here? So like, let's say feminist philosophers accept your definition of gender, that gender is essentially identical to sex and that they're going to stop using the confusing language and exclusively use the separate terms like gender identity, gender stereotypes, gender yeah. role, always make sure they're precise with these definitions. It doesn't really solve any of the practical questions because then now you say, okay, we can identify someone's gender. So like if you have CAIS, then we know in this matter of fact way, you are male, but we're going to treat you as female in every other respect. So what is the practical benefit to, uh, is it just the, the satisfaction of having a logically consistent argument and then the practical matters is more like this has to be our starting place? Well, it's more, I, I think it's much more, it's much more flat footed than that. I, I mean, in a way, it's very unseemly to pick out people with certain DSDs, disorders of sex development, and start, you know, debating whether they're really male or female, or or really men or or or, or women. And certainly, in the case of C A C A I S, this is just a sort of theoretical issue. It's not, it doesn't have any practical upshot whatsoever. I mean, who cares? It, 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 it's mm -hmm. neither here nor there whether, strictly speaking, CAIS individuals are 
are male or or female. It is of some slight theoretical interest, but that's uh, but that's about it. As far as the word gender goes, of course, your hypothetical scenario of feminist philosophers agreeing with me and using language according to my recommendations is is, is never going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. But that uh, uh, is, is is just the much more straightforward idea that um, in order to discuss topics, practical or theoretical, fruitfully, it's good not to not to get confused and use confusing confusing terminology. And certainly the word gender has been responsible for a huge amount of, of confusion. So if we can only discipline ourselves to use it in just one way, namely to mean sex, then everyone would be better off. I mean, everyone has an interest in getting the facts right or converging on the appropriate the appropriate social policy. Mm-hmm. Clear thought and talk is... Um, an essential means to that end. We haven't yet explicitly talked about transgender people, and this is kind of in the political backdrop of all of this. That seems like one of the most practical implications. So what I was a bit confused about still is, let's say we're talking about transgender women, natal males. So using gender in this precise way, they're still men. But in all other respects, they're transgender women, which means that they have a female self-identity. They might have more feminine characteristics. They might want certain social roles or rights of women. And you mentioned for things like whether trans women should be able to participate in women's sports or be allowed in women's only spaces. It should be looked at on a case-by-case basis. So like for sports, there's plenty of examples of how testosterone gives males an advantage. And if you go through male puberty at any point, even if you later block testosterone and are taking estrogen and identifying as a woman, you still have this permanent advantage. So that seems like a good example of when you need to make the decision on the basis of sex rather than gender identity. But the gender identity question still holds. Like, is it... is It almost seems like once you define gender in a certain way, it just pushes back all of the questions into questions about gender identity. Like, is that a thing that could exist as distinct from gender? Uh, Yes, um, for sure. Let me just say one thing uh, about the about the sporting issue. So when when I brought up sports earlier, I was careful to. Um, to use trans men rather than trans women as the example, because for the, for the reasons that you gave, there is no issue about trans men competing competing against other men because they don't have an advantage. Indeed, they almost certainly have a, have a disadvantage on uh, on average. Whereas with trans women, who, at least trans women who've gone through male puberty. The story is the story is very different. That's why the issue of trans women competing in the female sporting ca- ca- category is an issue, while the is- while trans men competing in the male sporting category is is not an issue. Okay, so as far as gender identity goes, when the term was originally introduced in the in the nineteen nineteen sixties, hi. It was first clearly defined by the psychiatrists Robert Stoller and Ralph Greenson in 1964. Ralph Greenson was Marilyn Mon- Monroe's psychiatrist, for, what's, for what that's worth. Um, they defined it in, um, in a very useful way it, as... Um, uh, the sense of knowing to which sex one belongs. And children develop gender identity in this sense um, very early on, around three or so. That is, they come to realize that they're either male or 
or female. Okay, so that the the irony is that the the original kind of gender identity, gender identity in the Stoller Greenson sense, is a very is a very useful notion, and it, it essentially gave birth to a very productive literature on gender development in in children. You know, when do children realize that I, uh, for for example, you can't change sex just by changing your your clothing and and behavior. What are the cues that children use to discover that they're male and female and so on? Uh, so that's all very useful, but uh, um, lately, gender identity has um, uh, come to mean something very different and something less something less useful and um, much more obscure, namely. Um, a kind of internal compass needle, which may or may not be aligned with your sexed body, and if it's misaligned, can give rise to feelings of distress, gender dysphoria, which might in turn lead you to transition to live as, to live as the other sex. So before, when it was originally introduced, Gender identity had a, a clear, useful meaning and wasn't itself really part of some theory. Whereas now, the, the dominant meaning of, of, of gender identity is different and is embedded in a kind of proto-theory of how people um, or why people transition from one sex to the other. It's because of a misaligned, a misaligned gender identity. And I argue in the book that gender identity in that second more contemporary sense is really a myth there's no such thing as uh, as as gender identity in in that sense mm -hmm. but of course there's still gender identity in the old stoller greenson sense the sense of knowing to which sex one uh uh the sense of knowing to which sex one belongs uh and there's there are also uh other notions in in the neighborhood, namely um, cross-sex wishes, wishing to be treated as a member of the other sex, for example, or strongly identifying in the sense of finding a sense of kinship with the other sex, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but none of these are gender identity as either understood by Stoller and Greenson or gender identity as people tend to conceive of it uh, today. This makes transgender an interesting concept because if we accept this definition of sex and gender as the same thing and binary and immutable, the whole concept of being able to switch from one to the other is nonsensical. So then what a transgender person is actually doing is not changing their fundamental identity, but just changing their self-perceptions and perhaps the way others perceive them. And the way they present themselves and perhaps changing their bodily characteristics. But all of these are almost more like ornaments on top of whatever the, their actual identity is. Is there a better way you would phrase that? Right. So, of course, some animals, some animals do change sex in the, in the wild. Hu human beings are not or mammals in general are not among them and current medical procedures don't allow uh human beings uh to change sex although who knows maybe they maybe they will in the future so if you're a natal male then you remain male even if you transition as we say uh to live as to live as the other sex um and of course if women are adult human females, then you haven't even transitioned from being a man to being a woman. You still remain, you still remain a man, although just to repeat, this doesn't mean, this doesn't by itself mean that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be treated as a woman, maybe treated as a woman in absolutely every, every respect. It's just that uh, you haven't literally changed being a man to being a woman. Um, I mean, I think the way to think of um, 
of of being transgender is simply that it it's um a transition which may or may not involve medical in intervention from living as one sex to living uh, as the other sex as a means to alleviate some psychological distress. So it's the um, uh, it's really the outcome of uh, of some procedure designed to make you happier, designed to make it easier for you to to function in in society. It's not um, it's not like a way of uncovering your true self or a way of literally moving from one sex to the other or moving from being a man to being a woman or 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 vice versa, but just an an essentially cosmetic palliative way of relieving a psychological condition. And that's not to say that um that people shouldn't do it. Sometimes palliative co cosmetic measures really can relieve psychological condition. This is kind of what I was getting at at the practical ambiguity because I think most people who care about this issue they're not exactly looking for precise definitions in for philosophical sake it's more like if transgender women are women I'm going to treat them as women and if they're not women I'm not going to treat them as women and yours is an interesting case where you say on one hand in this precise definitional sense they're not women on the other hand we should treat them as women and that kind of leaves someone who's looking for practical guidance, looking to have these definitions in order to inform their practice of do I treat someone as a woman or not on the basis of whether I define them as a woman or not with, without any obvious steps forward. I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, actually. So, well, in the first, pl in, in the first place, I, I, I should say that um, I, I'm not really a big fan of uh allowing trans women to compete in the female sporting category i think there are um inevitably some kind of compromise has to be uh to be reached um you know not everyone can be happy and in this case it seems pretty clear that the to me that uh the best solution involves turning the the men's category, in fact, in some sports, it's not even necessary to do this, uh, turn the men's category into an open category and mm -hmm. keep the female category uh, all female. Um, so I'm. it's not that I think that trans women should be treated as women in absolutely every circumstance, although I, I mean, like, I think the vast majority of people, I think that, you know, people should be treated with courtesy and and respect if you can possibly manage it and you know if you're some old school transsexual then uh you know you should be referred to in social contexts with female pronouns and whatnot and you know not gratuitously called a male and so on and just generally made to feel welcome just like anyone else yeah i think most people want to be good and respectful people. And then yeah, the question sure. is more, yeah. is it respectful to use the pronouns or not? Or is it lying? And that's, for me, what the issue hinges on. So, well, okay, yeah, you know, the, these are, uh, right. Yeah, things are definitely not, unfortunately, as, as, as simple as I, as perhaps I, I made them out to be. So here's one area where, um, the question of who literally is a woman or who literally is a, a girl or a boy uh, is definitely relevant, and that's in the case of, of children. So if you have children suffering from gender dysphoria, um, uh, maybe you think that the best way of relieving that is to socially transition them or perhaps give them puberty blockers or something like that. Uh, okay, let's set that. Um, can of worms to one to one side, uh, at least for 
at the moment. If to be a girl is to be a juvenile female of our species and to be a boy is to be a, a juvenile male, then it's literally false that trans girls are girls and it's literally false that trans boys are boys. Mm -hmm. So I would have thought uh, you should not tell trans girls that they are girls. You should not tell trans boys that they are boys. You should not tell them that if they carry on the path of transition, then, they, then trans girls will grow up to be women because they won't. And we normally think that lying to children is not a, especially about very important matters, is, uh, is not a good idea. So then there's a definitional question beneath how we define gender, which is, do we define pronouns by gender or by gender identity or preference or something else? Right. I mean, and pronouns are particularly, particularly tricky in, in the, in the, in the case of, um, natal females who've been socially transitioned or natal males who've been socially tr transitioned, because if Um, feminine pronouns uh, carry the background assumption that the person in question is female, then there is a sense in which you are deceiving uh, natal male children who've socially transitioned by calling them uh, she. And and I think it, as a, I, I, I discovered when I when I wrote a long paper on pronouns, that uh, people on the loosely speaking trans rights activist side in 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 philosophy sharply disagree with the traditional view that feminine third person pronouns in in, in English carry the presupposition or um, assumption that the person in, in, in question is, uh, is female. They think it's more like the gender identity as you were, uh, as you mm -hmm. were just saying. So calling a trans girl, she is not on their view to make any kind of mistake. Um, I think that that view is wrong. It is to make a kind of mistake, which makes the choice of pronouns for trans children, uh, particularly fraught. That is a difficult one. You know, this reminded me in a roundabout way of your introductory discussion of transracialism. So in some sense, if something is a social category, like some argue gender to be, whatever the answer to that is, and you and I think it's not, race is certainly even more of a social category. And, you know, all yeah. humans come from a subset of humans who migrated out of Africa. So there's more genetic diversity within modern day Africans than across all other races. So it's clearly not anything biological. It's clearly social and cultural constructs. And you can't change your race, but you can change your gender, at least in terms of what's seen as politically correct. Yes, that's right. I mean, that came out... Um... That came out very clearly, as I, uh, as I say in the book, when uh, Rachel Dolezal was uh, exposed as a white woman LARPing as a black one at more or less the same time that Caitlyn Jenner came out as transgender on the cover of Vanity Fair in, in, in 2015. So interestingly, uh, everyone seemed to be convinced that Rachel Dolezal was not in fact black, even though from a social point of view, her black credentials were pretty much impeccable. I mean, she went to a historically black college. I think that was Howard. She grew up with black adopted siblings. She was head of the NAACP chapter in Spokane, Washington. I think she lectured on Africana studies. 
Uh, nonetheless, when people discovered that her parents were unmistakably white, they all said, okay, she's, she's not black. Um, and, but I think that does, that, that does show actually that if there is a social component, I'm not even convinced this is right, actually, but if there is a social component to being black or being East Asian or being a Pacific Islander, um, there's also uh, a biological component as well, at least in the broad sense. So be, to be black is at least in part to have a certain kind of ancient ancestry. Mm -hmm. uh, Similarly to be similarly to be East Asian. Um, I mean, you you gotta have um uh sufficiently many lines of descent um from people who stayed behind in sub-Saharan Africa after um humans migrated out of it in order to be to be black. If you don't have that ancient ancestry, then then you're some other race. So there are a few threads, at least in my thinking, that it's it's something more about social passability that defines any identity category rather than some rigid definition. So in the case of Rachel Dolazar, who passed as black, like maybe people thought she was half black or unusually fair skinned. But until the thing about her parents came out, it seemed that she was accepted as black until she wasn't. And with the example that you gave about the dog that looks like a cat in all respects, but is fundamentally a dog, my thought was, why not just call it a cat? My thought with Rachel was, well, at least insofar as social categories of identity are things that are, that you can transition between, like gender, why wouldn't it also apply to race? unless it applies to neither. Either way, it seems like it would follow that you should have both or neither, but one without the other is a bit strange to me. And then there's also the thought of pronouns. So you mentioned if you have a biological female who's been taking testosterone for years and has a deep voice and a beard and male pattern baldness, most people would immediately just assume this is a man. And even if they found out this person was in fact born female and has been taking testosterone, they're probably not going to say, never mind, I'm calling you she now. Of course. But then for transgender women who go through male puberty, for the most part, although some can pass, they look much more masculine unless they get surgery. Uh, they'll probably have the deep voice and the Adam's apple. They might still have other very masculine characteristics like bone structure, large muscle, maybe even just height, and other subtle things that make it much more difficult to pass. And I have, it's more difficult for me to use preferred pronouns when it's, when I'm not registering it as this is the gender I think you are. So the interesting thing to me is that for trans men, if they're taking testosterone, I just assume that they're smaller men. Maybe they have slightly less deep voices or more patchy beards than the average man. But right. for the most part, I never doubt that if someone has a beard, that they're a man. And you can doubt it for more masculine looking trans women. And there's kind of this double standard that I see myself applying that bothers me because why am I making the pronouns or the social acceptability of what their gender is as contingent upon the outward secondary sex characteristics that they have. Well, you just find it. You, I mean, it's in a way a bit like, um, you know, if I really did have this cat like dog, um, you would find it so much more natural to think of it as a as a cat rather than a dog and if you knew that it was really it was really a dog i mean you, you have all these cues these in fact misleading cues that it's a cat so you reflexively apply the word cat to it ra rather than dog you really have to check yourself and think 
uh, if you want to uh, use those words accurately and call the animal what it is, namely a dog. Uh, and it's no, I don't think it's any different in the, in the, um, in the trans case and has nothing to do with being transgender in, in particular. So in the case of, in the case of pronouns, at least when they're applied to humans and, uh, and animals, the rule is apply the pronoun, apply the third person pronoun only if the animal is male, sorry, apply the third person pronoun that he only if the animal animal is male and if the animal is just giving off female vibes or looks exactly like a female despite being male it's going to be that much harder to use the appropriate the appropriate pronoun uh so i think you just pick your your point is just a reflection of the very general point that uh that we use these when we apply words to things, we very often use superficial cues that the word uh, that the word applies. It's not that um, uh, it's not that I um, apply the word book to this thing simply because it's a book. Rather, I apply the word book to it because it has the superficial characteristics of a uh, of a book. And of course, sometimes that. That can lead me astray. Maybe this isn't a book at all. It's just some, um, you know, it's like one of these fake books you sometimes find in furniture stores that they put on the, the shelves of their furniture. And in fact, it's just made of, there are no pages in it at all. It's just made of polystyrene or something. I'm noticing some contradictions in my <laughs> own thinking. So this is for the pronoun issue. And I can think of three possible outcomes. Now, one option is that we're defining gender on the basis of sex, and it's technically wrong to use any pronouns that aren't aligned with sex or gender. So this would be consistent with the view of you're lying to children if they have gender dysphoria and you give them the pronouns not of their natal sex. Yeah. The other option would be even if we're in complete agreement that gender is defined by sex, Maybe gender identity is what defines pronouns, and gender identity is separate from gender. Therefore, you always go along with preferred pronouns. And the third would be, it's more a matter of, I don't know how to frame this, but whatever is most convincing to oneself. So in this case, it might mean that you use preferred pronouns for a trans man on testosterone but you might not for a trans woman unless you perceive them to be a woman. And that's something that would be very difficult to argue for because then it almost puts fault on them of if they're just due to factors outside of their control, smaller or more feminine looking, or were able to go on puberty blockers earlier, then they earn the right of female pronouns. And if not, they don't, and you're the one to decide. That's pretty harsh. On the other hand, you don't want to lie. So if it's if it's more like the first option, then you wouldn't even use male pronouns for a trans man, even if they've been taking testosterone for decades and even if they have all the male characteristics. None of any of those three options seem satisfying to me. Well, to me, the the second option is ruled out because I don't think there is a conception of gender identity which would give you the results that you that you want i mean if mm -hmm. the if the conception of gender identity is the coherent one as originally formulated by greenson and stoller namely the sense of knowing to which sex one belongs that definitely does not give you the right result because many transgender people are under no illusion as to which sex they belong so you can have a trans man, for example, who knows full well that he's female. Mm -hmm. um, but then if your pronoun usage was guided by gender identity in that sense, you would call him she. On, on the third one, I mean, why, why isn't this 
just an instance of a more a more general problem that uh, sometimes words that 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 apply to people um don't obviously apply because of the way the person looks or dresses or otherwise appears. So, so for, for example, um, imagine a younger, fresher faced version of yourself, um, uh, let's say wearing a, you know, Harvard university sweatshirt or something. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and further imagine that you you are you are actually um, a full professor at Harvard. You're some kind of prodigy. Um, you know, you you got tenure when you were nineteen or something. And now 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 you're a full professor. Okay, people are going to mistake you for a Harvard student, mm -hmm. Harvard undergraduate, because you look just like an undergraduate, and in fact. You dress very much like an undergraduate with your Harvard sweatshirt. Uh, you don't look like the distinguished full professor that you are. So maybe you're going to be a bit miffed when people don't give you the uh, recognition that you so richly, so richly deserve. They're not going to call you professor. They're not going to automatically defer to you on the assumption that you're some fancy professor of biology or whatever. Um, and that's because, you know, you don't look like a stereotypical Harvard professor. You look much more like a stereotypical, a stereotypical undergraduate. Um, I, that's just an, I think that's just another example of the sort of thing, sort of thing you have in mind. It doesn't have anything in particular to, to do with the, with the, with the transgender. Yeah. I think if we're talking about strangers identifying you just on a first impression, that's absolutely understandable and forgivable. But in this example of the very young looking professor, if someone then finds out they're in fact a professor, but refuse to acknowledge that and keep referring to them as a student, that would be very rude. And in the trans case, I don't think we're talking about first impressions, but we're talking about, let's say someone doesn't strike you as a particular gender, but once they fully explain their identity, to you, they ask you to use a different set of pronouns. Now you have this information. And the question is, do you act on it? And I go back and forth on this. And it, it sounds like you might too, because when we were talking about the definition of pronouns, you said that you believe it's on the basis of gender, not gender identity. And gender we discussed is the same thing as sex, binary and immutable. Yeah. And yet, Throughout the book, and even as we're speaking here about trans men and women, you've been referring to trans woman as she and sure. trans men as he. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I don't see the... I don't see the, the tension, really. Um, I mean, sometimes... Uh, I mean, it's it's, it, it's part of ordinary um, human social interaction that um, we sometimes paper over some, you know, awkward facts, or we don't um, we don't utter some 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 obvious truths. I mean, if, I mean, for example, uh, I may be literally an idiot. I'm, um, I may really be extremely foolish, but that doesn't mean that you should come up to me and say, Alex, you are, you are an idiot, even though that would be literally correct. Similarly, I may be extremely overweight or ugly. That doesn't mean that you should say that I'm ugly or say that I'm, uh, or say that I'm overweight. Similarly, um, 
I mean, I am in fact pretty much bald, but imagine that I, that I wear a, wear a hairpiece and it's sort of somewhat ill-fitting and it's sort of clear that it is a hairpiece. Really, I am bald, uh, even though at 10 yards, I, I appear to have a full, a full head of hair. Still, it would be extremely impolite to do anything to draw attention to the fact that uh, I am indeed bald and I'm just wearing this uh, this rug on my head. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just part and parcel of um, getting on with our fellows that we um, sometimes shade shade the truth or don't uh, make a big deal of certain truths you know, just to avoid offense, to allow interaction to go much more smoothly, to avoid fights breaking, breaking out, to avoid gratuitous, gratuitously insulting people. So this is, I, I mean, so this is just an instance of a much, much broader phenomenon that pervades um, social life in, in general. Fortunately, you can usually avoid referring to things like bald status or weight, but the right comparison, I think, would be imagine a society or a language where you had a binary identifier as prevalent as he, she, but it was bald or not bald. And first thing you do when you refer to someone, unless you're using kind of indirect language, like the equivalent of only referring to you as Alex or they rather than he. It's kind of impossible to avoid. So one other option, which we didn't mention, would be just avoiding, in ambiguous cases, gendered pronouns altogether and only refer to someone by their first name or by a neutral pronoun like they. But that's also very awkward because it's clear that you're, yeah. you know, you're treating me in a special way. You're not treating me like everyone else. Right. Why, are you, why are you just calling me Alex? Why are you never calling me he? Right. Awkward yeah. no, and I, but I, No, I agree. The, um, yeah, the pronoun case is, is, is particularly tricky because pronouns, gendered pronouns are very hard, very hard to avoid. Right. So just to go, to go over it one more time, if we don't make any progress, then I'll move on. But there's the thought of exclusively refer to someone on the basis of their actual gender based on their natal sex, which would mean that in rare cases of someone being transgender and passing or even having an intersex disorder, and it turns out that they're not the sex you thought they were, then if you were be, being so consistent in your language, you would then switch pronouns always to match their natal sex. That seems absurd. And then the other one, the other option would be whether or not they pass, you do the socially polite thing. So in some cases, it's easier maybe for trans men on testosterone. It's easier to call them he. But in all cases, it's not like the pronoun should depend on testosterone use or not. So a trans man who identifies the same way but isn't taking testosterone, you should give them the same respect even if they don't have the deep voice and the beard. That would be difficult. And then the final option would be on a case by case basis, you get to decide basically based on how they seem to you. And even if the facts turn out to be different than what your initial impression is, you don't have to change your language. But then you're being logically inconsistent in how you apply it. I'm not quite sure I get the logical the logical inconsistency, but is the third option something like, yeah, just be, um, you know, all things be equal, err on the side, err on the side of politeness. Of course, there are cases where be being polite involves deceiving or or misleading people. Um, in which case, you probably shouldn't be probably shouldn't be so polite. Um, I mean, if you're setting uh, some guy up uh, with a date, you know, your friend Susan, who is in fact a trans woman, um, if you just used 
I'm not saying you should switch to to male pronouns, but it would be uh it would surely be reasonable to tell your friend, okay, well, Susan is in fact a transgender woman. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you if you just used her name Susan and uh, she her pronouns, then uh, he, he, you would give him every impression that this was just some regular female. Yeah, I'm a Kantian when it comes to lying, and the, the pronouns uh, one is especially uh, difficult. Well, then I, I know, okay, but if you are, then I see that um, uh, the pronouns are particularly difficult. Yes, there, there is a kind of um, uh, pronoun version of Kant's famous thought experiment about the whatever the mad axeman at the door or something. I mean, if uh, okay. The, the mad axon comes to the door and, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're sheltering some trans woman in, in your house and the mad axman says, you know, is she home? Then, you know, by your own lights, you wouldn't say she is not home <laughs> because that would, be, that would not be to use the appropriate sex-based pronoun. Oh, I was I was thinking in that specific formulation that gets you out of it because then you don't have to acknowledge any woman being home whatsoever. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> but you you could easily flip that and then you'd be in a predicament. Well, I I don't know what the answer is, but hopefully people will encourage that type of open doubt with the acknowledgement that one is trying to do the right thing, even if they're not sure right. what it is. Last piece I want to ask you about, which is a chapter that confused me. It's the chapter on autogynephilia and other sexual fetishes. I didn't see any clear linkage to gender identity, or I actually wasn't sure why that chapter was included. I don't. I don't think I got the message. Oh right. Um, well, it it's because um, so it follows a chapter on on gender identity, um, arguing that gender identity as it's popularly conceived is, uh, is a myth. And, um, as I recall, as part of, uh, as part of that chapter, I talk about, uh, early onset gender dysphoria and why some, let's just, uh, Confine the discussion to males, since males are generally the, the much more straightforward sex compared compared to females, and why some natal male children have gender dysphoria and, as a consequence, transition to live as the other sex. The reality star Jazz Jennings being uh, being a, a classic example. So, why do people like uh, like Jazz have uh, have gender dysphoria. Well, it's not because they have some innate gender identity, some inner sense of themselves as female, which doesn't match their sexed body, and as a result, they feel distress. Rather, I, mean, I, I think the much more plausible hypothesis is that these uh, boys are naturally very feminine, and uh, as a result, come to think, at least in some cases, uh, that they um, that they really belong on the pink team rather than rather than the blue team. I mean, this is connected with um, the sort of normal gender development when children try to classify themselves as members of one sex rather than than the other. So all all this makes perfectly good sense you could understand why an extremely feminine boy who doesn't like um boy toys or boy activities and much prefers hanging out with uh the girls and uh playing house to playing with trucks would become very unhappy with the thought of himself as a boy and mm -hmm. uh this is one classic route to a a transgender outcome 
early onset gender dysphoria, uh, leading to transitioning in adulthood. Now, I should say that for the most part, um, that isn't the result, and that the at least historically, the vast majority of uh, natal males with early onset gender dysphoria didn't go on to transition, and the dysphoria resolved around puberty. That 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 thing, that uh, historical pattern may well be be changing in the in the current climate. Anyway, that's one classic route to uh, a transsexual outcome in the case of of males. And the reason why the the next chapter, the chapter about autogynophilia is there, is, uh, well, on the one hand, it's a fascinating phenomenon, but uh, that more, more, more importantly, this is another classic route to a transsexual outcome in males, a much more interesting, uh, a much more interesting route. So here we don't have boys who are naturally very feminine from the get-go who think of themselves as girls or in very much want to be girls because they're just much more interested in stereotypically girly activities than they are in in boy activities but rather we have something quite uh quite different um an interesting kind of paraphilia or unusual sexual interest called autogynophilia labeled by the psychologist Ray Blanchard in 1989, which literally means love of oneself as a woman. Um, and so then I should add one one other thing. Uh, it, it, of course, um, even though some it used to be the case that many people resisted this this conclusion, um, childhood femininity in males is. Um, uh, highly correlated with subsequent homosexuality, similarly with childhood masculinity in females. So a lot of the, tra the trans women who followed this hyper-feminine pathway to transitioning will end up, in effect, being heterosexual. That is, they will be, they will be attracted to males. They'll be trans women attracted to males. In the case of um, in the case of autogynophilia, it's it's the other way. It's really the other way around that uh, trans women who've transitioned because of uh, autogynophilia um, will. There are some complications here which we can get into, but they are they they basically remain heterosexual. That is, that we transgender women attracted to um, to females. And in an already controversial topic, this yeah, 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 is yeah. And already, that's another thing I should this say. This is even more to controversial. Isn't the, the, it? What I just said is like in certain quarters is like hugely, hugely controversial, and uh, feminist philosophers in particular uh, would never, at least in the mainstream, would never discuss this well-studied aspect, fascinating aspect of male sexuality in a million years, let alone acknowledge its existence its uh, existence. One thing you talk about early on and throughout the book, Alex, is that philosophers love to just come up with crazy thought experiments that are sometimes controversial, not necessarily in a political way, but just wild speculations that maybe all consciousness is an illusion, all reality is an illusion, like anything you can think of is up for question. And often for something more politically charged, like gender, that's less so the case in philosophy. Do you see that changing? How is this book being received by philosophers? Um, I think uh, it's going to be pretty much. I mean, it's a it's a book that's in, in, intended for a, a general readership, not not for my professional colleagues. Although I hope some of them will get something out of it, but I. I, I think the book will be pretty much ignored by mainstream philosophers who work who work on work on on sex and gender. I mean it's very the book I can't help it, the book is really very critical of um a lot of that work. And 
generally people don't like it if you if you criticize their work at least as uh, at such a such a foundational uh level and also i i can hardly blame people for this the the idea of some outsider who's a man parachuting into feminist philosophy and saying, oh, you've been making all these terrible mistakes. Like, optically, that is not, uh, not the best look. Maybe I just have this romanticized view of philosophy. I'm thinking like of Socrates on the streets of Athens, asking people a bunch of questions, pointing out their own contradictions and really annoying them. Like people didn't like him and they sentenced him to death not really for legitimate reasons, but it almost seemed like just political motive. And there was enough time for him to escape Athens and avoid the death penalty. But, you know, he, he stayed wanting to back his word with his life. And that to me is the fundamental spirit of philosophy. And it's kind of surprising to me that people aren't excited when someone comes very provocatively. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my own profession has been a big, a big disappointment to me as far as, as far as sex and gender goes. But I, I should say, I mean, un, unlike Socrates, I don't plan on, on drinking <laughs> hemlock anytime, anytime soon. Um, I mean, interestingly. Philosophers, uh, just in general, are extremely tolerant of um, views that many ordinary people think extremely offensive. So take, for example, the philosopher Peter Singer, who has views on disabled infants and euthanasia. He thinks that in some cases it'd be fine to euthanize a disabled infant who otherwise would grow up to lead a reasonably decent life um uh of course that kind of view causes outrage uh in in the wider world and singer has been cancelled i think many times because of this and similar views but within philosophy itself the profession is just generally supportive and doesn't vilify singer many people disagree with him but he's not uh, he's not ostracized or, or deplatformed within within the profession. Another example is a philosopher called Stephen Kirshner, who um, made some remarks about. Uh, it wasn't real. Yeah, it was some something about something in, in in the vicinity of pedophilia. I don't even think it was technically pedophilia, but he made some 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 somewhat sympathetic remarks in the vicinity of pedophilia. Namely, well, maybe there's nothing obviously wrong about like consensual sex between an adult and an 11-year-old or something like that. That's not actually technically pedophilia. Um but the remarks were really very mild. Um, certainly by the standards of, of philosophy, and yet that caused a, a, like a huge firestorm, and he was barred from the campus of his university, and there's some lawsuit, lawsuit going on as a result. So um, he got a huge amount of pushback uh, outside the profession of, of philosophy, inside the profession of philosophy. Everyone was extremely supportive of him. And his and his academic freedom, uh, but when it comes to sex and gender, that really is the uh, the third rail. And people I mentioned before, uh, Holly Lawford Smith and uh, and Kathleen Stock, have really been dragged over the coals and had eggs and tomatoes thrown at them because of their views on on sex and gender or in particular on various transgender related transgender related questions and it would have been so great if philosophers had been um been adults and treated 
Lawford Smith and Stock as they treat Peter Singer and, and Stephen Kirshner, namely as philosophers who are arguing in good faith and okay, they may have outrageous or controversial views, but their academic freedom should be protected. They should certainly not be uh, no platformed or socially ostracized within the, within the profession of, of philosophy. But, but unfortunately, um, as far as sex and gender goes, the profession has really been completely captured by outside activists, or so it seems to me. Well, it seems fundamentally optimistic, just the act of publishing Trouble with Gender, because even if you're not the extreme Kantian to the extent of you never lie, not even to be polite, it's the idea that clarifying these definitions and getting the truth out there to a public audience, or even if there's no obvious truth to settle on, get people thinking about it and being open about what you can question, which in philosophy should be everything. All of that's very optimistic to me, and I'm glad you're doing it. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, it's funny you should say that. Um, uh, you, you should, that you mentioned question everything. I, I, I think that was the title of a collection of essays um, from the now defunct New York Times philosophy blog, The Stone. So the collection of essays from the New York Times by, by philosophers was called, I think, question everything, which is kind of the motto of, of, of philosophy. But then it turns out that as far as sex and gender goes, uh, that, um, that motto has a number of exceptions. Well, I think you broke them in trouble with gender. So maybe it'll be the beginning of a new dialogue asking yeah, well, controversial hope so. questions. Hope so. Thank you for your time, Alex. Oh, Thank it's you. a total pleasure. Thanks a lot, Adam. And everyone, 